Okay, let's get going. Today we're going to talk about encryption and some cryptographic concepts and a little bit about securing data communications. There are some, some vocabulary words. Cryptography is secret writing with ciphers. And it comes from a couple of Greek roots, cryptos meaning hidden and graphene meaning writing. Cryptology is the making and breaking of secret ciphers, and that is what happens at the NSA at Fort Meade, Maryland. Cryptanalysis is actually analyzing ciphertext, that is the encrypted text, and trying to derive the plain text. So we're, we're going to be talking about cryptography, reading and writing with secret ciphers. The rest of the stuff is done by scientists who are higher powered than I am. There are two goals of cryptographic systems. One of them is protection of confidentiality. If I encrypt something, presumably the adversaries, the bad guys, can't read it. The other one is protection of integrity. And there are a couple of ways that cryptography protects integrity. One of them is message integrity. We can assure ourselves that a message has not been tampered with, that nobody has changed the $1 check into a $1,000 check, for example. The other one is non-repudiation, or another one is non-repudiation. That is origin integrity. One of you has given me the look. Here's the, here's the deal. If you encrypt something with a secret key that only you have, it could only have come from you. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail and, and about the how, how do we know only you have it as we go along. The other part of integrity is authentication, origin integrity. And those are really basically the same idea. If I can authenticate the origin of a message, then whoever originated it can't repudiate it, can't deny that they sent it. Okay, the CISSP common body of knowledge says encryption addresses availability. So they, that CISSP says encryption addresses all three of CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Concerning the availability part, I say bogus. Now, when you take the CISSP exam, you're going to, have to, going to have to go along with them, right, and say it addresses all three, even though it's bogus. Okay, so this is the Caesar cipher. The plain text, the thing that cryptographers call plain text, is the message before it's been encrypted. The cipher text is the message after it has been encrypted. So I use this slide when I'm visiting elementary schools. Third graders can figure this out. How does it work? One letter down the alphabet, exactly. Thank you very much. That actually worked pretty well 3,000 years ago when almost everyone was illiterate, right? They didn't have a clue about alphabets or one letter down. And we could improve on that a little bit if we did oh, maybe 17 letters down the alphabet, so it was a little bit less obvious, okay? That worked for Julius Caesar. Um, it really isn't going to cut it in the 21st century. So a crypto system, cryptography, requires both an algorithm and a key. The algorithm is the procedure for transforming plain text, the unencrypted message, into ciphertext. And Kirchhoff's principle, uh, this is named after Auguste Kirchhoff's, who was, I think, a 19th century French cryptographer, is not the same as Kirchhoff's laws of electricity and magnetism, two different people. Kirchhoff's principle says the bad guys know the system. The algorithm has to be assumed not to be secret. The key then does have to be secret, it should be random, and it's a collection of data that gets combined with the plain text to produce the ciphertext. There are three major areas of cryptography. Symmetric key, or classical cryptography, the security depends on a key that is shared 
between sender and recipient. So, and I'm, I'm not going to call names because I'm recording, right? But the student who gave me the look, if he and I exchanged secret keys, I would be able to rely on the fact that a message must have come from him as much as I trust him to keep the key secret, right? If I don't trust him to keep the key secret, well, I can't rely on, on the message coming from him either. But we'll talk about some ways that we can do a little bit better job than that. A hash function is a function that transforms a variable sized input, like a message, into a fixed size output. And fixed size tends to be small, like 256 bits. That fixed size output has properties that depend on the hash function. It's called a hash function because all of the meaning of the message is lost in running it through that hash function. I like to think of the hash function as a fingerprint of the message. So if you change even one character in that message, the result of the hash function will change dramatically. Hash functions are what, what let us detect tampering in messages. The third major area is public key cryptography. Instead of having a secret key that we have to share with people with whom we want to communicate, each person has a pair of keys, a public key and a private key. And I'm using private in place of secret here to, to differentiate it between, to differentiate between the secret key of symmetric key crypto and public key crypto. That private key must be kept secret. The public key can be shared with anyone and everyone. If you wanted to find my public key, you could find it on any number of public key servers just by looking it up with my email address. Anybody can find my public key. Okay, symmetric key cryptography, that's the first of the areas that we're going to talk about. Sender and receiver share a common key or two keys that are trivially converted from one to another, either the same or trivially derivable. This, this symmetric key cryptography, and it's symmetric because the same key is on both ends of the transmission. It's sometimes called classical cryptography. There are two basic types, transposition ciphers, switch letters around, substitution ciphers, substitute one letter or symbol for another. If I do both transposition and substitution, that's called a product cipher. Okay, so with symmetric key cryptography, I encrypt by applying key and algorithm to the plain text. So key and plain text go into the algorithm, cipher text comes out. I decrypt by reversing the process. I use the same key, but the inverse algorithm. So here's how you remember that. Symmetric, shared key, and secret key are all the same thing, and they all start with the letter S. Here's a picture of that. I have a sender up there who has plain text and a secret key. The, the circle X is the algorithm, whatever it might be. That produces ciphertext, encrypted text, that I can send over an unsecure channel. And when I first started teaching this, I called that an insecure channel. And then a smart aleck undergraduate asked me if a psychiatrist could help. Um, so I changed all of my slides to unsecure. All right, the recipient has a copy of the same key, applies the key and the cipher text to the inverse algorithm, and retrieves the plain text. So that's symmetric key crypto. Now we need to talk about breakable encryption. A crypto system is breakable if with enough time it can be cracked. And in a minute I'm going to tell you that we can, we can trust some breakable systems because they are what we call computationally secure. And I'll define that as we go along. Okay, so we can crack breakable encryption 
either by deter determining the key or in some other way finding the plain text. We do still assume that the algorithm is known. That's Kirchhoff's principle again. Now, a crypto system that is breakable might, the slide says, require considerable effort. Gave an example that could take longer than the age of the universe to decrypt. And uh, one of my students says, well, the universe is only 6,000 years long, 6,000 years old. Without arguing that, I said, that ought to be long enough, huh? And uh, so I didn't have to argue whether the universe was older than 6,000 years. A crypto system that is known to be breakable but requires effort in years to break is known as being computationally secure. So it's breakable, we know how to break it, but we can't do it in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, absolutely secure. There is no way to recover the plain text from the cipher text without the key. And there is a crypto system that is absolutely secure. It's the one-time pad, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Computationally secure is a system where the time to recover the plain text is so great that the message has little or no value by the time it can be decrypted. Claude Shannon, who you met in chapter zero of the textbook, said that the amount of effort we put into encryption should depend on the amount of secrecy required. So if I have a message that says we attack at dawn, how long does that have to withstand decryption attacks? Till dawn, right. And generally when we're talking about dawn, we're less than 24 hours away, right? So if I've got a crypto system that will stand up to the enemy for 24 hours, that's good enough. I would like to keep my credit card numbers secret because if the bad guys get my credit card numbers, well, they'll charge flat screen TVs on Amazon and then Amazon will expect me to pay for them. 50 years ought to be good enough for that, right? Not for you, but for me. 50 years from now, I'm going to be dead and out of trouble. And Amazon can try to collect from me if they want to, but it's not going to do them any good. And that is an example of Shannon's principle, that the amount of effort we put into encryption should depend on how much secrecy we need. So computational security, there is one, there are a couple of ways to try to attack a crypto system. One of them is brute force. Try every possible key combination. And um, I don't think there's anybody in here but me who is old enough to remember. It used to be that the secure sockets layer in web browsers used 40-bit encryption. And the NSA complained about that and said, you can't export that. The bad guys might figure it out, and, and then we wouldn't be able to know what they were up to. A few years went by, and the NSA quit complaining about 40-bit encryption. What do we infer from that? They got computers powerful enough to crack 40-bit encryption by brute force. Try all, to, all two to the 40th combinations, right? And so they don't have to worry about 40-bit encryption anymore. There are also shortcut attacks. That, depending on the algorithm, there may be something that works faster than that brute force attack. With the Caesar cipher, I can do letter frequency analysis. The most frequently used letters in English text are E T A O I N S H R D L N U in that order. So I count the symbols in the cipher text, and the most frequently occurring symbol is very likely to be an E, a T, or an A. And the next most frequently occurring symbol is likely to be a T, an A, or an O. And for those of you who work crossword puzzles, once you get a few letters of the word, the rest of them are easy.
So frequency analysis will defeat the Caesar cipher, even if you do 17 letters down instead of just one. A breakable system could take thousands of years, even if we know how to do it. The RSA public key crypto algorithm, which we'll talk about later in the morning, is crackable. I, I can tell you exactly how to crack it, but cracking it involves finding the prime factors of very large numbers. We know how to do that, and if we could set a computer to computing for a few thousand years, it would find the prime factors of very large numbers. The bad news is that if we had a sufficiently powerful quantum computer, and we don't yet, finding prime factors of large numbers with a quantum computer is easy. All of public key crypto was feared to be about to disappear in a puff of quantum computing. And so the cryptographers invented this thing called elliptic curve public key crypto, and that one is quantum resistant. Okay, so encryption is a mathematical operation. Um, it used to be something you could do by hand, but nobody does that anymore. The strength is always in the key. The bad guys know the algorithm. The algorithm still has to be free from shortcut attacks. Keys ought to be both long and random. Keys get applied over blocks of data, so the brute force attack is to try all possible key combinations. If I have a 40-bit key that nobody uses anymore, you try all two to the 40th combinations, and see which one produces something that looks like English text or Russian text or Chinese ideograms or whatever it is that you hope you are decrypting. Okay, I told you a few minutes ago that the one-time pad is absolutely secure. A one-time pad is a cipher with a random key that is, long, is as long as the message and is used one time only. It is provably, in the sense of a mathematical proof, unbreakable. And here it is. Any part of the ciphertext is equally likely to correspond to any plain text. So if I have hello and it produces the ciphertext EQNVZ and somebody does a brute force attack and says EQNVC looks like it should be hello. But then they keep going grind crunch whir, and they say EQ NVZ ought to be later, or any other five letter word, because they're all equally probable. We're not going to try to prove it randomly, I mean, mathematically, but you could. Okay, each key has to be used one time and only one time. Otherwise, you give an adversary multiple examples of ciphertext encrypted with the same key. The keys must be random, or the adversary can attack the ciphertext by trying to regenerate the key. Pseudo-random numbers might be okay, oh, maybe for protecting my credit cards for 50 years, but they're not random and someone could attempt to attack the random number generator and reproduce the key that way. Beep the slide before I should have. The problem with the one-time pad is key distribution. If I have a key that I'm going to use both to encrypt and decrypt, I've got to get it to the recipient of the message. And that probably means sticking it in a steel briefcase, handcuffing it to James Bond's wrist, and putting him on an airplane to deliver the key. Key distribution is the hard part of the one-time pad. Okay, so at this point, um, I have a simplified version of this that I talk to middle school kids about. And the middle school kids are all set to go develop their own crypto systems. And while that might be fun, it isn't safe. Trustworthy crypto system has to be based on sound mathematics 
has to be analyzed by experts. And an expert is somebody with a doctor's degree in mathematics and about 10 years experience working for the NSA. I am not an expert. Has to have withstood the test of time. And so the moral of all that is it's not as easy as it looks. When you pick a crypto system, pick one that has withstood that test of time. We had this thing called the data encryption standard for many years. The data encryption standard has some weaknesses. It is breakable and it's now breakable in a reasonable amount of time. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, formerly called the National Bureau of Standards, held a contest to select the successor to the data encryption standard, something that was then called the Reindahl algorithm, and that's made out of parts of the names of the two guys who devised it. It's now called the Advanced Encryption Standard, and it has been a U.S. standard since 2002. The Advanced Encryption Standard was designed to withstand those attacks that were successful on the data encryption standard. I'll tell you in a minute that the National Institute of Standards and Technology is not done holding contests and picking encryption algorithms. Okay, the problem with secret keys is you're trying to use cryptography to prevent, to protect either unsecure transmission or unsecure storage. The problem, how does the recipient get the secret key? Out of band transitions is one way to do it. That is, put it in the steel briefcase, handcuff it to James Bond's wrist. But if you had a, a secure way of transmitting a key, you could just transmit the message that way. So that is the key exchange problem, and it is the problem with secret keys. There are several algorithms for exchanging keys. One of them is physical transfer, that steel briefcase. Or for something that requires less intense security, I could hand you a flash drive and say, here's the secret key we're going to use to communicate with one another. We could use public key encryption. That's also called asymmetric encryption. Remember, symmetric encryption was called symmetric because the same key was at both ends. Asymmetric encryption uses different keys, one at the sender's end and one at the recipient's end. Okay, asymmetric encryption does not provide for forward secrecy, which we'll talk about in a moment. There is an algorithm specifically designed for key exchange, the Diffie-Hellman elliptic curve key exchange algorithm. And the book that I used when I was studying crypto systems for my doctorate says elliptic curve encryption is difficult to explain. And boy, are they right. So we're not even going to try to explain elliptic curve encryption, but I will tell you that it is quite likely to be quantum computing resistant. As far as anybody knows, April of 2024, elliptic curve systems are resistant to cracking with quantum computers, and that's a good thing. So if we had a lock and two keys, I have a V like Victor key and a B like Baker key, and this lock, it's, uh, there's a padlock picture on the slide, but you can't just snap it closed like a regular padlock. You can lock it with one key and only unlock it with the other one. So if I locked it with the Baker key, it can only be unlocked with the Victor key. Baker, if it locked it, will not unlock it. And the reverse is true, too. Um, if I locked it with the V Victor key, I cannot unlock it with the V Victor key, I have to use the B Baker key. That is essentially the way public key encryption works. Baker and Victor are inverses of one another with respect to that very strange lock. Each of them will undo what the other one has done. So the idea is I give each of my friends one of those locks, they're all alike, 
and I give each of my friends that Baker key. I keep the only Victor key. My friends can now send me a locked box, which they locked with that Baker key, and I'm the only one who can open it because I've got the only Victor key. This is very cool. Now, now my friends can communicate with me secretly. Public key cryptography or asymmetric key cryptography works the same way. There's a pair of keys. We encrypt with a key that is publicly available. And a little earlier, I told you that my key was on several key servers all around the world. You can look it up with my email address. Actually, the key servers talk to each other. So there's a fair chance that whatever key server you're using has my public key on it, even though I didn't put it there. I decrypt with a different key known only to me. That is my private key. So that B Baker key is the B in public, and the V Victor key is the V in private. I couldn't use P because there's both of them, right? Um, how does it work? Something that mathematicians call a trapdoor function. A trapdoor function is easy to compute, but undoing it, the inverse, is a problem that is called intractable. And if you remember reading the book, an intractable problem is one for which we know the solution, but the amount of computation that it would take to find the solution is impractical. Okay, a trapdoor function, easy to compute, the inverse is intractable. If I ask you to compute 293 times 307, a couple of you can probably do that in your heads. Everybody can do it with a pencil and paper. You don't need a calculator or anything else. That's going to be real easy to do. The product is 89,851. If I instead, if I didn't say anything about 293 and 307, if I instead said find the prime factors of 89,851, I could go away and come back next week before you were done. Okay? There's an algorithm to do it. And actually, with a five-digit number, you could probably do it in a few hours with a computer. Okay? Now, instead of using three-digit numbers, suppose I use hundred-digit numbers. Now I've got something that with the fastest computer anybody knows about, finding the prime factors of a hundred-digit number is something that's going to take decades. We know exactly how to do it. It just takes a long time. The public key cryptography, except elliptic curve public key crypto, works that way. So one of you creates a pair of keys, a K, key sub V, Victor, the private key, and a K sub B, Baker, the public key. The ciphertext message is a combination of that public key and the message. Anybody can get the public key. Deriving M, the message, from the ciphertext message and the public key is an intractable problem. We know how to do it, but it's going to take decades of computation. Deriving the private key from the public key is intractable. We know how to do it, but it's going to take decades of computation. However, finding the plain text message from the ciphertext message and the private key is straightforward. It's computationally intensive, but it's done in seconds rather than decades. Okay, so public key crypto seconds rather than decades. Um, we'd really like something that happens in small fractions of a second. Public key encryption, 10,000 times more work than secret or symmetric key encryption. Why? Difficult arithmetic, that is exponentiation, on very large numbers. So we're going to do something to make the computational effort of public key crypto less. The solution is we're going to generate a random one-time secret key that's called the session key. I'm going to encrypt the message with the session key. 
All right, that session key is maybe 256 bits long. The message might be a megabyte or more. I can encrypt the session key with the recipient's public key. Now I'm doing um, public key crypto, but I'm doing it on something that's only 256 bits long. So that's going to happen in a second or so. Then I send both the encrypted message and the encrypted key. And we'll see a picture in a minute. Finding the prime factors of large numbers is intractable for von Neumann architecture computers. It is not hard for quantum computers. If this, if this rings your chimes, look up something called Shor's algorithm, S-H-O-R. And if you understand Shor's algorithm, you probably understand quantum computers. You do not need to understand either of those things for this course. Shor's algorithm can crack that asymmetric key crypto in seconds. Okay, happily, there are no quantum computers big enough to do that. This is good news. We have until about 2030, as far as the people who, who actually research quantum computers, before we'll have one that blows public key crypto, as I just described it, right out of the water. All right, 2030 is not all that far away. Six years, right? Back in 2016, that same National Institute of Standards and Technology said they're going to hold this contest and select some quantum-resistant public key algorithms. They published a list of 26 finalists in 2019. They expect to have a final draft this year, as of April 9th, which is the last time I checked, they had a list of three algorithms that are quantum resistant. Those are public key encryption algorithms that are quantum resist resistant, and they are based on elliptic curve encryption. This is the NSA data center in Bluffton, Utah. You can see some automobiles on the road there, which will give you an indication of the size of that thing. What the NSA has built that data center for is to store all of the encrypted data that they have wiretapped until they have a computer powerful enough to decrypt it. So I am a sort of contrary kind of guy, as some of you may have figured out. I have a friend who uh, we have pizza every week and we negotiate what kind of pizza using email messages so we don't have to sit there in the restaurant to decide. We have encrypted all of those email messages for several years using, <laughs> using public key crypto. It's no trouble for us. I'm sure the NSA has them stored in that data center. And in 2030 or 31, they'll know what kind of pizza we had last Friday. Be encouraged to encrypt your email too, just to frustrate them. Okay, now the problem with asymmetric cryptography for key exchange is if the private key is compromised, and remember that's the one you're supposed to keep secret, all past and future messages are also compromised. So if somebody gets your private key, they can decrypt the session keys in all past and future messages. This is kind of bad news. Okay, so the solution is don't use asymmetric crypto for key exchange. Use, use it for authentication, right? And we'll talk about authentication in a moment, but use Diffie-Hellman elliptic curve key exchange to exchange that session key. That way you get a new session key every time and the session key was not encrypted by any static key, any key that someone could, you know, if they could look inside this computer, they could find my private key. That is forward secrecy. Okay. Some public key crypto algorithms, not Diffie-Hellman, um, work both ways. The keys are inverses of one another. If I encrypt a message with my private key, Anybody can decrypt it with my public key, 
but I am the only one who could have encrypted it because I'm the only one with that private key. So that message is digitally signed, and that is exactly analogous to a handwritten signature. Anybody can read it, but I'm the only one who could have written it. Now, how much can you trust that I'm the only one who could have written it? Exactly as much as you trust that I have kept my private key truly private, which I have. All right, so we've talked about symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. We haven't talked about hash functions yet. The idea of the hash function is to make a fingerprint of a message so I can detect whether it's been tampered with. A strong hash function is one where the hash of a message, H of M, is easy to compute. We don't want to spend a whole lot of time doing this. Deriving the message from the hash value is infeasible. Not intractable, but infeasible. Given M the message, finding another message that produces the same hash code, that is H of M prime is equal to H of M, is infeasible. If I could find another message that produced the same hash code, that's called a collision attack. And I could substitute that another message from the original one, and it would all check out. So we want our hash function to be something that makes that infeasible. Okay, instead of encrypting an entire message with my private key to digitally sign it, I run the, the plain text message through a hash function, and then I encrypt the hash result with my private key. It's short, 256 bits again. Anyone can decrypt the digest using my public key, but I am the only one who could have encrypted it if you believe that I have kept my private key truly private. So that message is digitally signed. If the digest matches the message, the message has not been altered. So here's a picture of that. Everything that's green is plain text. The encrypted digest is yellow. It's yellow because it's encrypted, but anyone can decrypt it. Okay, I've encrypted it with my private key, so anybody can get my public key and decrypt it. The recipient uses my public key to decrypt the digest, then uses the same hash algorithm that I used to compute a new digest over the message. If they are equal, Number one, that message could only have come from me as much as you trust that I have kept my private key private and it hasn't been tampered with. Nobody has changed $1 into $1,000 or $1,000 into $100,000. The trouble is that it is not confidential. The message was green in plain text. Suppose I encrypt message and digest with the recipient's public key. Only Betty can decrypt that message because it needs her private key and now it's confidential. And that would work like this. Message and encrypted digest get packaged together and encrypted with the recipient's public key. That one's red at the bottom because only the intended recipient can decrypt it. And it works this way. The recipient decrypts the whole package and now has message and digest and can do that thing I just showed you to validate the digest, just like we saw it a moment ago. The trouble with that is that that public key encrypting of the message is computationally intensive. So here's how that stuff works. The sender generates a random session key and uses the sender, in this case, Alice is sending this message, encrypts the session key with Bill's public key. Alice computes a message digest and signs it by encrypting it with Alice's private key. And the message gets encrypted using symmetric key or classical crypto, something like the advanced encryption standard, using that random session key. And now all three things packaged together 
digital signature, encrypted message, and encrypted session key all get sent off to the recipient, Bill. Bill uses Alice's public key to decrypt the digest. Bill uses Bill's private key to decrypt the session key, and then uses the decrypted session key to decrypt the message, retrieving a plain text message, and can now compare a computed digest to the decrypted digest. And Bill now knows that this message was transmitted confidentially because it was encrypted. It could only have come from Alice with, with the caveat that we trust that as much as we trust how private Alice has kept her key. And it hasn't been tampered with because of the digital signature. So let's spend a few more minutes talking about identity. This is a very famous cartoon. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And I will tell you something that I hope, I hope never saves any of you, but it might. On the internet, all the men are real men. Almost all the women are really men. And every single hot teenage girl is an FBI agent. Okay, there are no hot teenage girls looking to meet you on the internet. They're going to lock you up. And that is the problem with online identity, right? Okay, that was 1993. Almost nobody knew what the internet was in 1993. Okay, one way to prove identity is this thing called a digital certificate. We have the principal's identity. The principal is the, the person place or thing that we want to be sure we have identified. In this case, Amazon.com. Principal's public key, the hash function that's being used, the signer's identity, in this case, VeriSign, and then a digital signature. So what we have with that is VeriSign is telling you that if the digital signature validates that this really came from Amazon.com. Everything is in plain text except the digital signature, and it's been encrypted with VeriSign's private key, so you can decrypt it with VeriSign's public key. Amazon presents this certificate when you connect to their server, and it says, VeriSign has promised you that we are really Amazon, and you can stick your credit card number in there. Now watch what happens if somebody tries to change something. Do a man in the middle attack. Okay, the, the key part of what was on the previous slide was Amazon's public key. Here, Evil Eve has, has substituted her public key for Amazon's. The digital signature no longer validates. If Eve tries to substitute her public key for Amazon's, the digital signature fails, and we can find out that we should not trust that certificate. When your web browser says, I don't think you should trust this certificate, believe it. Okay? So, in order for Evil Eve to successfully forge a certificate claiming to be Amazon, but having Eve's public key, not Amazon's, Eve has to have access to the signer's private key, and we hope this is hard. And I say we hope this is hard because there have been several instances of leakage of signing keys from certificate authorities, not just one. This, this happens every now and then which is really bad. Something that we're not going to talk about but in detail here, but that is a defense against that is this thing called certificate pinning. You first get a certificate, you then never accept another one for Amazon.com. So if somebody can successfully forge one, you still won't accept it because you, you pinned that first one that you got. Told you last time we talk about pass keys. A pass key this is the thing that everybody wants you to use instead of passwords. It is a credential, and it's a, it's a 
handful of bits, right? Something stored on a device encodes both an identity token, that is a user ID, and your private cryptographic key. The credential gets stored on your device, your phone, your iPad, your whatever. It is protected by the access protection for the device. Let me say that again. This pass key is protected by the access protection for the device. Now, I said this last time, if you're the kind of guy who leaves your phone sitting on a bar somewhere and your passcode is 1234, pass keys are not for you. If your device and your, and your unlock code are compromised, so is your bank account, your Amazon account, any other thing you have a pass key for. So enrollment that is creating the account stores the identity token, user ID, and the public and the corresponding public key. So if I'm signing up with Truist Bank, and sadly they are not far enough ahead to do this, when I create a pass key with Truist, I'm going to send them my public key and my user ID. I'm going to keep the private key and keep it secret, okay? Now I have a pass key for my bank. I say, bank, I want to authenticate. The bank sends a challenge message. This is likely to be a random number. I get prompted to unlock my phone. When I unlock my phone, the phone pass key app on the phone signs the challenge message using my private key. Okay, Truist sent me the challenge message, the random number, so they can know that they're getting, they can check that they're getting back the same random number. But now it's been signed using my private key. And if you believe that only I have my private key, then you can believe that it's really Bob Brown who is on the other end of this exchange. If validation succeeds, access is granted. So what does that buy us? Well, there are no weak passwords because there aren't any more passwords. No chance to use the same password for every website that you ever visit. No phishing. Only my bank has the corresponding public key, right? The bad guys don't have that public key. No data breaches because no passwords stored on the server. Bad guys hack into Truist Bank. They don't find my password because there aren't any passwords. The unlock data, the pattern that I put into my phone to unlock it or the numbers or whatever, retina scan, fingerprint, those never get sent to the server. The unlock data stay on the phone or the other device. However, and this is the third or fourth time I've said it, if the adversary gets both the physical device and the unlock mechanism, everything is compromised. Every pass key you have on that device is compromised. That's kind of bad evil. Okay. We had the plague in 2020, the whole world slammed shut, nobody got any work done, and a whole bunch of jobs transitioned to remote work. Some of them are back, most of them are not. I am one of the few faculty members who's willing to teach an in-person class. Most of your other classes are, are remote. Now, I'm here after terrifying myself driving up I-75. You know, you can drive I-75 northbound in the morning. You're going 75 miles an hour. I'm going 75 miles an hour. The signs say 55, right? And people blow your doors off on both sides. But at any rate, not all jobs are back to on-site. So securing data communications is much more important right now than it was in 2019. We have this thing called TLS, Transport Layer Security. That's the thing that was originally called SSL, Secure Sockets Layer. It was developed by Netscape 
to make it safe to type credit card numbers into the World Wide Web. This happened back in the dark ages of 1995. The current standard is Transport Layer Security, RFC 2246. It uses TCP to provide reliable, and now we're talking about reliable in the sense that messages are acknowledged, reliable end-to-end -end service. And we might either provide TLS in the protocol suite itself, or it could be embedded in a package like a web server. Okay, TLS gives us message integrity. We get a message authentication code that is encrypted with a shared secret key. The message authentication code essentially detects tampering with the message. We get confidentiality because the message itself is encrypted. When you first open up a site that's protected by TLS, there is a handshake protocol, and server and client negotiate an encryption algorithm. Message can also be compressed before it's encrypted. And if we have enabled Diffie-Hellman elliptic curve key exchange, we get forward secrecy. The session key used for this exchange is ephemeral in the sense that it will never be used again and nowhere is there a key that was used to generate it. So that's protecting messages. Until 2020, a lot of organizations had a focus on per protecting the perimeter. We're going we're to build ourselves a fort and put big tall walls around it, protect the network from outside intrusion. And then, five years ago, all the employees started working from home and everybody had to have access from outside. So the protecting the perimeter strategy depended on firewalls and intrusion detection. Firewall is a router or a general purpose computer or an appliance or something that controls the flow of packets between trusted and untrusted networks. So basically it looks at the contents of packets and says, yes, I will let this one in, no, I won't let that one in. An intrusion is the bad guys either trying to or successfully gaining entry into a computer system. Incident response, that is identifying, remember prevention, detection, and response and recovery from last time? Identify, classify, respond to, and recover. That's incident response. Intrusion prevention tries to deter intrusions from occurring at all. And one way to do that is when suspicious traffic is encountered, we're going to change the firewall rules on the fly to block that suspicious traffic. Intrusion detection monitors the system for trying to find, either in real time or pretty close to real time, events that indicate an intrusion. So the National Institute of Standards and Technology says you have intrusion detection outside your firewall, so you can find the people who are rattling doorknobs and trying to get in, inside the firewall in case someone gets through it, on the network backbone, that's up at the top of the diagram, and between the network backbone, the internal or trusted network backbone, and any critical subnet like, for example, the bank's processing subnets. So how do we do remote access with this thing called the virtual private network? What makes it private is encryption, and we'll use something like TLS, Transport Layer Security, to encrypt traffic. It's still traveling over the public internet, but now it's encrypted, so people who are trying to snoop on the traffic can't see anything that's important, can't be examined by others. And so I can use a VPN to connect branch offices, that is, set up a connection that is that stays set up, or I can use a connection from an individual employee's computer each time the employee wants to log in. Now, what it doesn't protect against is traffic analysis. 
I can see who is communicating and where they are, although not necessarily what they are sending, okay? Because, and that was, that was the perimeter stuff that was around in 2019. Organizations now are talking about endpoint security rather than perimeter security. And that becomes important with that large remote workforce. Endpoints are any device that connects from the outside into the corporate or institutional network. So it includes computers, tablets, mobile devices, whatever else. Tablets is misspelled. I wonder if I'll remember to fix it. Endpoints include things. The point of sale terminals in Walmart, smart watches, teller machines, medical devices, anything that has to connect to the corporate network. So endpoint protection should include virus protection. It should include central management of the endpoints. Now that's kind of hard when employees are doing bring your own device, but there are some ways to, to at least compromise. And it must include end-to-end -end encryption with a VPN. Something to try. Um, if you are using Windows, get GPG for Win, or for Mac, GPG Tools. Um, if there are any Linux types in here, GPG for Linux also. Create your own public and private key pair. Use the largest key size that is available for the application that you've got. Upload it to a public key server. Get a friend's public key and try to exchange email. Have your friend sign your public key. Signing a public key is effectively saying, I promise you that this public key really belongs to Bob Brown because I saw Bob in person and he handed me a printed copy of it. And you can read all about it in uh, Blogspot about it's time to encrypt your email. So who has questions? All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen and lady. Have a good afternoon, a nice Wednesday, and I'll see you on Thursday. This is the last of 24 classes of hardware and software concepts. Congratulations, you made it to the end. I hope you've enjoyed the course. I hope you've learned a lot and buy my book. Thank you very much.